So now we just discuss uh, these various um, aspects of cloud computing, which are called uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. And they're illustrated here. At the bottom, we have the hardware. At the top, we have the uh, tools and the applications. So at the end, at the top, we have applications. I've put a couple of um, chemistry applications, AMBA, which is a molecular simulation, <coughs> the bioinformatics application, BLAST, very, which is probably the most best-known biology application. So that's called software as a service. So these, these applications, you won't go to a website and download AMBA and download BLAST, run it on your local cluster. You will go and look on a, on a, on a registry, find the different sources of AMBA and BLAST, look at their costs, look at what databases they have attached to them, and choose the best one of those, uh, of those offerings to, to run your application. And so that's called software as a service, that you, the software is sitting there running on a cloud, and the user chooses to access that software. There's some uh, non-trivial effort in getting the data out up there, but uh, that's the model. So software as a service is what the system, what you see. I put up there various systems, a couple of system examples, SQL as a service, which is database as a service, and Globus Online, which is a nifty idea for data transfer as a service. Those are sitting on what's called platform as a service, which is sometimes called middleware, uh, or tools, or runtime. These are the higher level concepts, which actually is what you do your computing in. And the commercial clouds effectively offer platform as a service. <coughs> Alternatively, the platform as a service actually sits on infrastructure as a service, and that is the bare hardware, the hypervisor which supports the virtual machine, and the actual images and appliances, which is your combination of operating system and, and various tools. And uh, here's at the level where you'll see virtual clusters of virtual networks. So you can build, because you not only want to get one machine, you might want to get lots of different machines uh, to run a large application. So this is the way clouds are built. Infrastructure as a service, which you'll hear a lot about, with these three systems, Eucalyptus, Nimbus, and OpenStack. Platform as a service, which will be a particular focus tomorrow. And then the end goal is always software as a service. As far as I know, this uh, stack is reasonably uncontroversial. There's tremendous amount of work at all levels of the stack. And I expect progress in all, in all areas. So here's some slides from KT here. Mm -hmm. This first one is probably similar to the one I just did. So here's explaining to you how um, infrastructure service works. You have, uh, in her case, it would be Nimbus. And you would then set up, send a message and set up your um, set of nodes. And the, the, inf the infrastructure will publish information about the nodes. Once you've got that through Nimbus or OpenStack or Eucalyptus or Open Nebula in Europe, you would then be able to do your work. So the infrastructure service is the one supplying you the collection of machines that you want to use. And <coughs> there are sorts of all sorts of interesting features, including, of course, the price. And also, uh, as you know, if you ever go to Amazon or, or Azure, you can choose different memory sizes, different numbers of cores, and uh, things like that. And that's obviously pretty, you have to optimize that to get the best uh, value for your, for your money. And uh, Amazon at least offers GPUs as a possible option for your infrastructure. And uh, we will hear about GPUs on Friday. And here's some examples of, of clouds. Future Grid offers essentially a cloud. There's Magellan, which is <coughs> essentially a finished product in its original form. And uh, ScienceClouds.org. Commercial clouds, um, Amazon and Azure were here about. Google actually just gave in and offered infrastructure as a service, given the huge success that Amazon and Azure had. With, actually, Amazon had. Azure, a few weeks ago, announced that they were going to support Linux, not just .NET and Windows. 
and uh, they were also supporting infrastructure as a service. Previously, as a just supported Windows and platform as a service. So it's clear there's a huge, um, uh, this is a very vigorous <coughs> field with plenty of competition, which will mean plenty of jobs, um, and also plenty of you should be able to decide which of these various systems you want to use. So these are just the um, uh, various um, features that uh, you need to have to build build a cloud. I've already gone through several of them. The ones highlighted in yellow are Mac, uh, the storage and programming models, MapReduce and the queues and the table and the file systems. I did want to make this one comment here that there is a pretty interesting um, difference on in some sort of debate about how to store data, both in cloud and in fact on HPC systems. Um, this slide here is your traditional data storage. You have a compute cluster and you have a storage cluster or a storage system here. There's various implementations, but and the huge advantage of this approach is you can have multiple storage systems and every cluster can access every storage system and it is very easy to share, etc. And there are various uh, systems like GPFS and Lustre, NFS to support this sharing. Um, there's also something called an object store, which is the most common uh, use of cloud, which is sort of similar to this, except it doesn't store files, it stores objects. And uh, that's what S3, for instance, in Amazon supports. But there is a, another possibility, which is I call a data parallel file system, which are, and here the, here the idea is different. You have, you do not have clusters and storage separately, you have them on top of each other. And this is, uh, was pioneered by uh, Google and others for information retrieval with various uh, sub additional technologies like Big Table, which allowed them to have the computing right next to the data. And this is a well-known principle where Jim Gray of Microsoft is, is sort of known for pioneering of bringing the uh, computing to the data, not bringing the data to the computing. As for the traditional file system, data's over here, the computing's here, so you have to bring the data to the computing. That still may be very efficient, etc. so it's not necessarily a disaster, but the data parallel file systems are pretty interesting in a world which has more and more data, because they clearly have the opportunity to have the most efficient use of data in computing. <coughs> and for instance, uh, Alicia Hu has no archival file system. Uh, we had a talk uh, at the CloudCom meeting two years ago <coughs> from Yahoo, and they emphasized, they just took, made four copies of every data. They made some, one was a long way away, so it wasn't, uh, it was particularly, um, um, insensitive to any disasters of the main, main copy, and those four copies gave them the necessary fault tolerance. 